All right, and at this time, I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Carrie Moan. Carrie is Effort of Cloisters uh, curator, and he is going to talk to us and introduce us to some of our new acquisitions, items that we recently acquired as part of our collections. So Carrie, I'll let you take it from here. All right, everyone, thanks for um, tuning in tonight. And um, you're going to see some um, new acquisitions that go back um, back to uh, 2017 or so, and up to the present. Uh, many of these acquisitions, uh, some are purchases, some are gifts. There's a nice variety of different kinds of things here. There's books, there's uh, furniture, there's paintings, um, ephemera, different kinds of things are are here tonight. Okay. <laughs> Oops, I got ahead of myself. Okay. First item here tonight is, um, is a martyr's mirror of the, the second German language Martyr's Mirror uh, published. This was published at a place called Permacens, which is, was on the French border. And it was uh, the first German language edition, of course, was printed at Effort in 1748-49. The Permacens edition was printed in 1780 through the efforts of a group of Amish bishops from the area. Their copy differs a little bit in that they used a smaller font. So they, their, their edition is about 200 some pages uh, smaller. Ephraim's runs about 1500, theirs was about 1300 or 1250 or somewhere in there. And one more thing that they had that the Ephraim Brotherhood did not have is they had access to the copper um, plates that were used to illustrate the 1685 Martyr's Mirror published in, in Holland. So their book has those, uh, those plates, and uh, which makes that pretty special. This is the front cover of the, of the Permacens edition that we have. Uh, you notice uh, the, the brass is along the top and the edges protect it. Um, there's a heavy brass boss in the middle here. There's, a, there's one clasp is missing. The book is really in pretty nice shape. And it seems to have really traveled, and I'll get into that in a moment. You'll notice here in the front, uh, down here in the lower left corner, there is some damage, which probably have happened a really long time ago because somebody attempted to put it, an old repair on there. Here's a close-up of that brass boss right in the middle of the page, AG. It's believed that that AG stands for Adam Gillum. Uh, Alan Gill Gillum was, um, you might say, the progenitor of this family and probably the one who in the 1780s purchased this book. On the back cover of the book is the year 1786. And that apparently is the year that uh, Adam Gillum purchased the book. My understanding is that this type of um, uh, binding was very, um, very much uh, an Amish style binding at that time, especially putting the date of the book and the owner's initials on it. Title page of the Permacens Martyr's Mirror um, pays tribute, you might say, to Ephrata right there on the title page. Basically, the Permacens edition was a copy of the Ephrata edition. They, they used the Peter Miller translation from Dutch to German, and basically copied an effort of one to, to print uh, this edition. You can see effort in Pennsylvania there. One thing that really makes this book in particularly is special, and, and even though um, there was a little bit of damage to it and we bought it sort of sight on, well, I shouldn't say we bought it sight unseen. The owner of the book had, um, a relative sent us a bunch of pictures of it. 
But one thing that was inside, pasted on the inside cover is this document. This document is a proof of baptism so that the carrier, the owner of the book could prove that he was um, fully baptized you know, wherever he went. And over the top here, you can see that Christian Gilliam of uh, the Canton, I'm not sure what that exactly says there, but of the Can he, it was, he was in Bern. He was the son of Johannes Gilliam and Elizabeth. And um, it goes on to say that he was in full communion with them, with the group of uh, the, uh, where they were. They were in, um, they were in a part of the Bern Canton known as the Jura, the Jura Mountains, which were on the French border. That was an area where uh, many uh, Mennonites uh, fled to, you might say, to escape persecution uh, later on in Switzerland. And being on the French border, I think there was a certain amount of uh, French and, and German um, language spoken. Uh, this Christian Gillum, uh, as far as we can tell, immigrated to the United States about 1821, 1822. Unfortunately, there were famine. There was a famine going around and um, many, uh, many Mennonites left the area to get, uh, get out of that, that situation. Christian Gillum's son, Abraham Gillum, had this wonderful book plate uh, pen that is pasted on the flyleaf in the front of the book. As you can see, he was living in Sugar Creek Township, Wayne County, Ohio. I think to this day yet, that is uh, a Mennonite um, settled area. Um, the book plate was penned in 1843. As far as I could tell, this Abraham eventually moved to Missouri. He had a very large family. I was able to trace two of his children to Indian, Indiana. This book was purchased from a party from Indiana. So I'm just imagining that one or both, of, one of those ch children, one of his children, carried it to Indiana with them uh, where, um, where it wound up and where we purchased it from. This was purchased with uh, funds from the Back to the Cloister Fund. Next up here is um, two portraits. I apologize a little bit for the quality of this, port of this picture and the next one. I tried to retake these this week and they, they, the pictures I took uh, were not any better. So I'm, I went with, um, with my original pictures I had taken. This is Solomon Gorgas. Uh, his dates are 1764 to 1838. He was the oldest son of Jacob Gorgas, a clockmaker at Ephrata. Solomon also learned clockmaking. and was a clockmaker at Ephrata. Uh, his father died in 1798. Jacob died in 1798. And about 1800, Solomon Gorgas moves uh, to Lower Allen Township in Cumberland County. He gives up clockmaking to run a store and I think a hotel. Uh, so he completely gives that up to go into a more um, different kind of business pursuits. Uh, this is Catherine Faunastock Gorgas. Her dates are 1774 to 1853. Catherine um, was, of course, from the Faunastock family. Solomon was from the Gorgas family. The Gorgas and Faunastock families were important, prosperous, and influential uh, householder families. They came from Amwell, New Jersey, uh, in the late 1730s or so to Ephrata. Catherine and Solomon were married in 1791. They eventually had seven children, four of which were born in, uh, in Ephra and three in Cumberland County. It's believed that Jacob Eichholz painted these portraits. I'm gonna go back to Jacob for, uh, uh, excuse me, for Solomon a little bit. Uh, it's believed that Jacob Eichholz painted these portraits, although there no signature has been found on the, on the paintings. They certainly are in a, a, a Eichholz style, but what also sort of gives a little bit of 
uh, credence to the Eichholz um, painting is that Catherine's brother, Charles, and his wife, Susanna, had their portraits painted by Eichholz. Catherine also had a first cousin, Dr. Samuel Faunastock, and his wife, Barbara. He painted their portraits. And she had another first cousin, Judge Obed Faunastock, and his wife, Anna Maria, also painted Eichholz painted their portraits. So it seems pretty um, logical that maybe Eichholz also painted, painted Charles, uh, excuse me, uh, Solomon Catherine Gorgas's paintings. It's possible that the signatures are hidden by the frame. Uh, I found one instance where there was an Eichholz portrait that the signature was hidden by the frame. At some point in time, uh, the paintings probably need a little bit of cleaning and conservation and uh, at that time, maybe the frames can be removed and we can take a really good look. This was a gift of the George Gorgas Twitchell family who were direct descendants of Solomon Gorgas. And I will uh, bring that family name up later on with another uh, a gift that we received. One of the more um, unusual items that was given to us was a receipt for a love feast on June 11th, 18, well, June 11th, 1802. Well, the, the receipt is dated that day. George Zinn, you can see George Zinn uh, Jr. paid six pounds, English currency, um, to have um, a love feast for his father, George Zinn, on this line here. George Zinn uh, was the miller and operated the community mill for many years. And uh, he died on March 12th, 1802. What's interesting about this is the payment was made to Sister Sophia, uh, who was Christiana Funk. She was one of the last celibates and one of the last celibate sisters to live. She died Ju uh, July 14th, 1811. But I think what makes this fascinating is the fact that um, the, the old, this old sort of ritual was still being carried out. We know from Sangmeister's writings that some love feasts were being done in, as sort of a memorial uh, to a deceased celibate member or community member. And even though the community had dwindled quite a bit by 1802, especially the celibates, they were still doing a love feast as a memorial to a deceased member. There's not a whole lot known about that period of time uh, between the, um, um, you know, you might say the, the death of Peter Miller in 1796 and the last sisters who died in 1813. Yeah, that time period is a little unknown to us exactly what was going on, but we know that at least the love feast was still being conducted. This was a gift uh, to the site from Jim Shuddy, who gave, us, gave this to us during his lifetime, but he has since passed on. Come on. <laughs> I'm having a little trouble trying to advance this, um, unfortunately. We have another book here, as you can see from the front cover, it has seen uh, very hard wear. I think that cover though is the original cover. It's very reminiscent of other original covers we have in the collection. Uh, very likely that was, the book was uh, bound here right at the cloister. This is a copy of the Paradisishish Delicii um, parts one and two. It's two books bound together. Sorry about that, folks. I can't seem to find uh, uh, the advancement. Here's the title page for part one. These are epistles that were written by Conrad Beisel. And part one was originally published in 1745.
Here's the title page of part two. The date on part two, it's a little, it's a little fuzzy down below there, but it's the same date, 1745. But it's generally believed that part two was originally printed in 1773. The collection already had co a copy or two of part one. We did not have a copy of part two. Here's an example, and sometimes uh, both books were bound together as this in this situation. The um, Friedsam Godric, of course, right here in the middle is, is Beisel's name, uh, his cloister name. This was a gift um, that came to us through Somerset Historic Center. Um, a volunteer out there had uh, this book and made uh, Mark Ware of the, uh, aware of uh, Mark Ware uh, made him know, you know, told him about this book and he called us and it was passed on to us. Um, all that we could find out about this book was that it was in that family for a very long time, but they don't know where that, where it came from. But we suspect that a lot of effort of items were carried down along, you might say, the southern border of Pennsylvania, you know, because um, people associated with effort were moving down in that area and even further down into Virginia for a number of years. And, um, you know, of course, Snow Hill in Franklin County was a was another uh, celibate community um, that branched off from effort of, but then there were congregations elsewhere along the Pennsylvania border with Maryland. This rye straw basket, this very large rye straw basket was a gift to us from the uh, Historical Society of Dolphin County. It fits very nicely in the collection because we have so other very large coiled rye straw baskets. There was an old record at um, Dauphin County saying that this came from Ephrata, but that there was really no other information about that. But in trying to look into the, the provenance, as we call it, of this basket, we find out that there's a couple of possibilities of how Dauphin County got the basket. One of them is that a man by the name of Luther Kelker may have had a hand in this basket coming from Ephrata to, uh, uh, to Dauphin County. Luther Kelker was the custodian of public records at the State Library during the administration of Governor uh, Pennypacker. Governor Pennypacker was, a, a, you might say, a, a fan of the cloister and even had a few cloister artifacts in his collection uh, down at Pennypacker Mills in Montgomery County. We have a letter that was pasted to the back of one of our wall placards, one of our wall charts that was written by Kelker uh, from 1905 the, the, pl the placard had been taken to Harrisburg and was um, conserved in 1905. And he, he uh, recorded that on this letter and even named the two women who did the work, which was, I think, very significant uh, that he named the two women from their department that did the repair work uh, to that wall placard. What's even more fascinating about it is the same year in 1905, the Christian ABC book was also transferred to Harrisburg. And we're thinking now that the same women that worked on that placard also worked on um, the ABC book, which was in Harrisburg in the State Library until 1917 when it was returned to the cloister. But getting back to the basket, uh, a president and a very active member, uh, Kelker was a very active member, apparently contributed many things to the collection at uh, Dauphin County. But a friend of his was George Gorgas, who was president and very active um, in the Dauphin County Historical Society as well. Uh, George Gorgas was the great grandfather of the donors of the two paintings of Solomon and Catherine uh, Gorgas. At one time, the Dauphin County Historical Society had uh, Solomon Gorgas's effort of books in their, in their collection. A number of years ago, I think about 1987 or so, 88 maybe, 87 I think, uh, Dauphin County sold the Gorgas effort of books. We fortunately were able to get one of his music books that was owned by Solomon Gorgas. So we have a portrait of Solomon Gorgas and his wife, Catherine Gorgas, uh, we have one of the music books that he owned, and now we have a basket that 
very possibly came to Dauphin County and then to us uh, through George Gorgas and, uh, and maybe Luther Kelker had a hand in that as well. Here are, uh, here's a photo of six class rosters from the Effort Academy School. At the time that these rosters were issued, the Effort Academy School was part of the uh, Effort Township School District. And it seemed at the time, I mean, nowadays uh, or more, I, I guess still they still do this. Um, school students get their pictures taken every year and then you get a, a large photo a large composite of everybody's photo on it. At least I got one when I was in elementary school. Well, at that time, uh, you were given a little a little booklet uh, with the names of everybody that um, attended school that year. And uh, we have uh, six different years here that were given to us by, again, by Jim Schutte, who was a uh, um, very uh, active person at the Historical Society of Chicago Valley and uh, was a school teacher. He was a collector and a dealer. And he told me that he got these some time ago at an auction. He didn't really remember any more than that. Uh, the years represented here are 1914, 15, 15, 16, 19, 18, 19, 19, 19, 19, 20, 19, 20, 21, and 1923, 24 which gives us a total of 11 of these rosters for a number of different years uh, for the Academy School um, right here on the grounds of the cloister. For most of those years up till the end of 1921, Annie Moeller was the teacher at the Academy School. Beginning the following year, uh, a woman by the name of Bertha Miller from 1921 to 1926 was the teacher at the Academy School. Uh, the Academy School was closed at the end of the school term in 1926. These six rosters were owned originally by two sisters who attended the school, Annie and Mary Zimmerman, who wrote their, they're listed in the, the roster, but they wrote their names inside the covers, and that's how we know that. This is just an extra image of um, the 1923-24 roster. Um, it included a memorial to the late uh, Warren Harding, President of the United States, who had died in 1923. Um, and I'm showing you the cover uh, close up and then uh, the memorial to uh, Warren Harding. It uh, pictures uh, two, three schools that Warren Harding went to on the top and the middle and next to his portrait and on the bottom. This particular roster is a little bit more significant. I didn't show this, but two photos were included inside. One was of the teacher, uh, Bertha Miller, that unfortunately was, um, it, somebody tried to remove it and tore it and basically tore most of it. The other picture in there is a picture of the schoolhouse taken from across the street. And um, it's, a nice, it's a nice photo. Um, uh, taken around 1923, 1924 of the building, especially since we know the date of the picture. We're going to move on to another gift for the site. This is an effort of Martyr's Mirror. I took a shot of this, a picture of this from sort of from an angle. So you could see the cover, but also, you could also see the clasps that hold uh, the covers together. This Martyr's Mirror is, of course, an effort of one from 1748-49. And this was a gift of the family of Dorothy May Cockle and Samuel Widler Graybill. Dorothy Cockle, of course, was the daughter of um, Reuben and Catherine Cockle. Uh, she grew up here on the cloister grounds and even attended the cloister, the academy school in the cloister grounds. She got married in 1932 to Samuel Widler Graybill. Their children uh, donated this uh, copy of the Mars Mirror to the site. The significant thing about this book is it's, it's the only Mars Mirror that we have with a connection to, uh, with people to the cloister. This is the title page of the first part or what is known as, um, the, you might say, the new book. 
uh, when this was published originally in 1660 by Thielman Jan van Bra. He brought, you might say, the story of the martyrs from the time of Christ up to about the year 1500. The old was known as the old book, part two. Here's the title page to part two. Was the story of the martyrs from about 1500 to 1660. It was called the old book because this was a compilation over the years of many different martyr stories. And some of the earliest martyr books were very tiny and could easily be hidden because, um, well, basically it was against the law to, to have them. Some of those early martyr books do not even have a publisher or a year or anything in there to indicate who may have printed them. The, um, this compendium over time got bigger and bigger and bigger. And now this so-called old book from 1500 to 1660 um, is part two of the effort book. One thing I wanna point out to you here is this is probably the cleanest and the, the nicest condition. Now the cover is a little worn, but the pages in this book are just about as clean and bright as if they were printed very recently. There's very, very little um, foxing on the pages. There's a tiny little damp stain right up in here, but it's a very nice book. Um, uh, one of the family members that donated this, who actually had it in, in his possession, said that the book was rarely ever taken out of storage to, to be looked at. It was basically kept put away. The book came to Dorothy and uh, Samuel Graybill from his parents uh, as a wedding gift in 1932. Uh, the Graybills were involved... Um, they were Mennonites originally from Switzerland, the Grey Bills, but eventually they, um, you might say, drifted or became members of the Brethren Church. And uh, two of the two of the Grey Bill, um, the grandfather and great grandfather, were one was a deacon and one was a minister in the in the um, Brethren Church. So this may very well have come down through them as well. So it had a very nice uh, nice providence. And like I said, this was a gift from the Grayville family. Along with this book, along with this copy of the Martyr's Mirror, we received two broadsides. And a broadside is a single printed sheet. This broadside here is what is known as uh, simply as a Concordia broadside because it um, contains the story. Well, actually, not well. It's a story, but it's in the form of a song. It's 29 stanzas, and the title translated is a song about the miraculous passing. There was a little bit of trouble trying to uh, translate that word. It was Fatalian which does not translate into modern German very easily. It's been guessed at that it means passing or fate of the beautiful Concordia, a commandant's daughter in Hungary. This, um, this broadside is believed to have been printed about 1793 by Solomon Mayer. Solomon Mayer had assumed uh, uh, the printing operation at the cloister after the brothers gave up in 1792. Uh, Another mayor, not related, Benjamin Mayer, uh, took over the printing uh, after Solomon. And then in about the year 1800, after Solomon Mayer moved to Harrisburg, uh, John Bauman took over printing in effort. And I'll get into that a little bit more later on. The late Don Yoder, um, in his book on broadsides, says that uh, the Concordia broadsides were all traditionally associated with effort of printers. And we will see another Concordia broadside uh, a little bit later on by a different printer. The gist of the story here is that um, it goes back many years. Um, according to Yoder, the human bride of Christ theme originated in literature going back to the 13th century. Essentially, the commandant, who's not named, promises his daughter Concordia to a prince 
And hearing upon this, she was very distraught because she only really had one bridegroom. So the day of the wedding, the wedding was set, and in that morning she goes to the garden and she prays, prays wholeheartedly uh, for Jesus to make an appearance. And he does. He comes to her. He takes her to heaven where she spends, it's not really known how long she spends in heaven, but after um, some time there, she is brought back to earth. Apparently this was a, she was only in heaven for a very short period of time, but when she comes back to earth, it's a hundred years later. And when she comes back, she tries to find her her father and her house, and it's not there anymore. Her, her father was, had, uh, had died uh, many, many years before, a hundred years earlier. And um, the town hearing of this story uh, wanted to restore everything to her that was in her family, and she refuses. She says, all I need is a place to be laid down. This type of story was very appealing um, uh, to the uh, Efri community because it involved, you know, the, the relationship of like, you know, men uniting with Sophia, women uniting with Jesus. Another broadside also came with, with this uh, Martyr's Mirror. It's not dated and it's not attributed. We basically are calling it the Three Songs Broadside, probably printed to make some money for the printer. Uh, he could print some songs and then sell these uh, to make a little bit of money. The, the top song translated, it's, it's it, and I'm gonna probably not pronounce this very well, but Ein, Ein Schern Geistlich Lied, Lied is song. It translates to a beautiful spiritual song. And just today, when I was preparing for this talk tonight, I discovered that that song was printed by Joseph Bauman about 1820, it's believed. Now, I'm not saying that Bauman did this broadside or this was from about 1820, but that was the first time we were able to at least find something out about one of these songs. The second song translated says, The Dying Woman's Lament. And the third song is Ein Summer Lead, a Summer Song. Um, not, much known as a, not much is really known about these songs, except the very first one, which I discovered today, something about it. Um, and we'll have to do more research, maybe to try to find out more about these and maybe find out who printed this and when it was printed. As I mentioned earlier, we have another Concordia broadside. This was a purchase from the Clark Hess estate. And once again, through back to the cloister funds. Clark Hess was quite a collector and, and uh, his, his um, holdings were sold in three sales, three catalog sales. And actually there was even other things sold at uh, horse during their regular Wednesday sale as well. This uh, Concordia broadside, we know though, was printed by Samuel Bauman um, about 1816 or so. Uh, John Bauman had taken over the printing from Benjamin Mayer in 1800 and died in December of 1809. His son Samuel took over that printing business and printed from about 18, well, from 1810 to about 1816. It's not really known when he gave up printing. Uh, he died in 1820 as a fairly young man. The woodcut, though, that illustrates this broadside was used by Samuel Bauman uh, on the cover of the only bound book that he printed in his years of printing. Samuel Bauman um, printed many, uh, the, the, a lot of what he did was, was broadsides. House sagans, house blessings, uh, birth certificates, baptismal certificates, things of that nature, maybe very small pamphlets, but um, that was about the extent of what he did. Um, Samuel Bauman's father was Christian Bauman, who was one of the first trustees when the German Seventh-day Baptist Church was established in 1814. And Christian Bauman also had a lease on the old uh, cloister paper mill uh, and had operated that many years. Uh, he died in 1815 
and that uh, would sort of lead to some trouble um, in how that was uh, resolved. About 1816, 1817, uh, Samuel Bauman's first cousin, excuse me, uh, Samuel Bauman's first cousin, Joseph Bauman, took over the printing until 1830. And uh, Joseph Bauman was not involved in the German Seventh-day Baptist Church. And it seems that he maybe had, um, he butted heads with um, the uh, trustees of the church over, di over different things. Harry, while you're on that, I'm going to interrupt a minute. There's one question about uh, the second Concordia from Hess. Does it have the word? And here, you know, I took Spanish, not German. So pardon me when I massacre the word here. Fatalian, F-A-T-A-L-I-E-N. Yes. Is part of the text. Does it? Yes. Um, I really tried to work on that. And there just was not a very good translation of Fatalian. Um, it's been, it's been sort of theorized that it stands for fate or passing. Uh, that's how, you know, that's how we, um, that's what was came up with, uh, what that word means. It, um, it was unfamiliar to, um, to some of the people I had consulted about that. Thanks. I just thought while okay. you were on there. Sure. Okay. Okay, this little book here, uh, actually a very thick little book, um, is a bi essentially a Bible. It's a, 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 a Martin Luther translation of the Old and New Testament, but this is a very, particularly important to us because this book was owned by Elizabeth Boldhauser, or Boldhauserin, which is the feminine form of the name. There's over a thousand pages uh, in this little book. This is a picture basically gives you an idea of the cover and, and then the pages. I don't get into this a little bit more in a moment. The book was printed in Lemgo uh, in 1748 and 49. That was after the Boldhausers had already come to the Ephrata area from Amwell, New Jersey. They, they arrived here with, um, with the Fauna Stocks as well. They originally were in Amwell and they came here with the Gorgas, the Fauna Stocks. And um, and the bold housers. How little is it? A uh, question from in the house here. Uh, I asked, uh, how little is this book? It's about three and a half by six or so, and it's about uh, mm, three and a half, three and three quarter inches high. This way. I included this picture in here because this is the paste down inside the cover. Now the front cover is detached, so that made it pretty easy to get this picture. But I thought it was rather interesting to see the, the design of the paste down inside the cover, very different than what you usually see. And this is the book plate. Uh, for Elizabeth Boldhausen, you can see the I-N on the end of her word, or her name, her last name, right in there. The inscription says, Wilt du mit Goddess Schar from Thron des Lamas stehen? So must du deine Zot all here mit Thrian saying. And there is a little bit of loss down here, but we were able to figure that out. Translated, the inscription says, if you want to stand with God's flock before the throne of the lamb, then you must sow your seeds with tears. We particularly uh, were very much interested in this book because here is a book that was clearly owned by a, a female member of the effort community. We had some other book plates in Martyr's Mirrors, but nothing like this uh, in the collection. Something really different to show off effort style Frochter Schriften. Elizabeth Boldhausen married Peter Fonestock in 1757. On the next page after the, the um, book plate, 
uh, their daughter Hannah uh, wrote her name on that flyleaf. This includes this book. <laughs> oh, I don't know why this isn't doing this. I do one click and I jump about six ahead. This is the, well, it's, it's not the title page of the Bible part. This is a six page uh, tribute to Count Simon August. Um, of, uh, he was the Count of uh, Lip Detmold or Leip Detmold from 1727 to 1782. And I guess it's not too unusual for uh, royalty to add their name to a book. Uh, we're all familiar with, I guess, the King James Version. And, and I think Henry VIII had a, a version of the Bible. And uh, Simon August, of course, had this book printed in Lemgo. Um, 1747 is when this was printed. And it seems to have been a special date for uh, the Count. Because that was the year that his guardianship ended and he became the the ruler in his own right. His mother was uh, in charge of his guardianship and that ended when he became of age in 1747. The book not only uh, includes the Old and New Testaments, it is bound also with a Reformed Church songbook and a catechism, catechismus book as well. So that's why it's almost a thousand pages. This, again, was another purchase from the Clark Hess estate with Back to the Cloister funds. Now, the next, the next book here that you see was an Eckerlin manuscript book written by Israel Eckerlin from the Allegheny Mountains after the Eckerlins were uh, basically made to feel unwelcome and they leave effort in 1745, they move about 400 some miles into the deep frontier of Virginia. Later, they moved around a couple more times. This book is, a, is a one of four that are known that Eckerlin wrote and uh, sent back to effort one of the books already in the collection has apparently been at Ephrata always. It was always here. It never left, and it's in the collection today when it was received in the mid-1750s. This book was purchased uh, from the Clark Hess estate. And I'm going to show you um, a few pictures of some of Israel Eckerlin's writing. Right. It's amazing how I jump ahead. I, I'm having trouble seeing this. It doesn't want to come up. Oh, you know what? I'm oh this is this is not good. I'm actually was for I was I was going forward. Here's an example of um Israel Eckerlin's writing. As you can see, it's he fills an entire page from top to bottom and from side to side. Uh, with this very fine penmanship. That is the, essentially how the whole book is written. 250 pages like this. It's basically a theological treatise, uh, but there's also two letters included with the book that were written in the pages in the back. Here's a little bit of a close-up of um, Eckerlin's writing, Israel Eckerlin's writing, Brother Omnisimus. Uh, with this nice little uh, bookmark uh, in the form of um, a triangle. I can't imagine writing this by candlelight. I guess maybe he did it in the daylight. I don't know. But uh, um, it appears, though, that many of the pages were scored. So that's why the lines are so, sh so straight. But um, he must have had a very steady hand, too. Here is um, the, the end of the one letter that's dated December 1st, 1755, written by Israel Eckerlin to the chief administrator at Ephrata. I'm sorry to say that I do not know the content of the letter at this time, but maybe someday we can uh, get that translated. And it was from the Allegheny 
Geberg or the Allegheny Mountains. A second letter signed by Samuel Eckerlin dated September 26, 1757 is also included in this book. Another purchase from the Clark Hess estate is what we call the stove room book. Fortunately, the title page is missing, but this book is a book of, um, about, or about the writings of Madame Guillaume, who was a favorite at the cloister. Madame Guillaume was a French mystic and a quietist. She was imprisoned in the Bastille, I think twice, because uh, her writings and um, were considered heresy by the official church in France. And um, she was, her, her writings were popular among Quakers, Moravians, and other pietist Protestants. Quietism rose on the continent between about 1670 and the 1680s and um, was popular in um, Portugal, Spain, France, Italy. Um, quietism um, emphasized contemplation over meditation, uh, stillness over vocal prayer, uh, passivity over pious action, and also emphasized union with God. And uh, that was considered heretic heretical, causing her to spend time in the Bastille. The inscription on the book is, Dis Buch gehort in der erste Stube in Saren. Translated, this book belongs in the first stove room in Saren which was quite remarkable because there is no other known book that mentions a building at the cloister and also creates a little bit of a mystery for us to figure out uh, 200 some years later, what was the first stove room in Saren? Um, as built, Saren had uh, two stove rooms on each floor. Later on, when the building was remodeled around 1745 for exclusive use by the sisters, I mean, originally it was built for men and women, um, they added a, a third stove room on each floor. So uh, after 1745, there were um, nine stove rooms in the building, three in each floor. Now, which one was the first stove room is, is the real question in history. I have a, here's a picture of Madame Guillaume, a print of her. Madame Guillaume died, um, um, I'm gonna, you know, I sort of forgot this now, around 1718, I think. Title page two. The 1754 Paradisisch Wunderspiel. Not to be confused with the 1766 book published at Ephrata, also called the Paradisisch Wunderspiel. This is a particularly um, important book, and we were able to purchase this book at, pro at, an, at public auction. Not a it was not Clark Hess's estate, it was public auction in Harrisburg. All the, all the music in this book was composed by Conrad Weissel. This was the first time that the effort of community attempted to print printed staffs and, and lyrics in their music book. The notation still had to be added by hand. It did not have the ability to uh, print music notes. That had to be added by hand but this did have music staffs, and we'll see this in a moment, and some of the lyrics inside. According to Alan Beemeyer, um, Ephraim many times had its own sort of um, definition of some words. Uh, the definition or the translation of this, while spiel is usually means play, in this case, it is paradisical wonder music. 
And you can see the date down here, 1754. Here's an example of um, what it looks like inside. The staffs and some of the lyrics, of course, are printed, but uh, the music notation had to be added and in spaces, they added small decorations. A large part of this book is also, this includes the Song of Solomon as well. This is page 71 and 72. Here's 85 and 86. Hundred and forty five and hundred and forty six, a nice little flower at the top. And one hundred and eighty seven and one hundred and eighty eight. You might if some of you watched uh, Chris Herbert's presentation a few weeks ago, you may remember some of the same type of decoration and some of the images that uh, he showed. This is a, 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 a like a ledger size book. It's the largest uh, music book, not not in pages, but in size. It's the largest music book printed by the African community. What was curious about this book is that apparently it was in the Fultz family for many years. The Fultz family, uh, Moses Fultz, Emma Fultz, and her brother Charles were the owners of the uh, Chambersburg uh, Public Opinion newspaper for many years. And apparently Emma Fultz Kramer, her, her married name was Kramer, uh, was the last person to own this book and another copy. There were two copies of this. And um, they, were so, uh, they were both sold uh, at Cordier Auction in Harrisburg. Now we come to a, a gift. Uh, Dr. David Fuchs gave us this book. This came from the Clark Hess estate. And um, the name uh, von, uh, von der Nickleit Menschlichen Lebens um, translated means a spiritual lesson about the futility or it could be translated the nothingness of human life. The, the little... Um, this little pamphlet seemingly is unknown anywhere else. We have a broadside we'll see in a little while that has essentially the same title. And uh, the confusion of this, when I saw this was listed in the sale um, of the Hess estate, I started looking for this online and I could only find one reference to this title. And that was from the 1920s and this came from the Governor Pennypacker collection. Now the cataloger in the 1920s called it a broadside, but this certainly is not a broadside. It is a small pamphlet. There's three songs in here and uh, it seems the little pamphlet, little booklet was published maybe for use at a funeral because of the nature of the songs, but we just don't know that. There's the end of the first song. The second song is Ein Ander Schern Geistlich Lied, Lied a Song. That translates into a different beautiful hymn. And that's the end of the second song, was 12 stanzas. The third song, I'm not going to attempt to read that. What it translated is a sad song about the death of a mother and son. Someone then added a couple pages in manuscript, which seems to be a, uh, can either a continuation or a repeat of this song. There's two pages of manuscript. What's fascinating, well, here's the back of that one and then a little bit here. What's fascinating about these manuscript pages that somebody sewed in extra to this little pamphlet is down in the corner here is a CB uh, watermark. And a CB watermark was used, one of the ones used by Christian Bauman, who um, operated the 
uh, for a paper mill for many years. He had a 30 year lease that ended in, in uh, 1820. He died in 1815, of course. His son, Joseph, who took over the printing of his cousin, had been running the mill after his death. And here is the, um, the back of that last manuscript page and then, the, and then the last part of that song, that third song. And here's the back page of that. Now, according to some research that Dr. Fuchs did, um, the first two songs in, in this little pamphlet appear in the Mennonite hymnal uh, that was first published in 1804. So that maybe gives a little bit of a date possibly to this little pamphlet. But the third song is unknown. The one, the sad song about the death of a mother and son is, is unknown at this time. Maybe we can find it somewhere. Now we're gonna to come to a piece of furniture, uh, a blanket chest given to us by the family of the late uh, Harold Keller Galebach. This chest was in the Galebach, well, in the Keller family, uh, all the way from um, about 1783 up until uh, when it was given to us in 2019. This is a picture on the front of the, of the um, uh, blanket chest. The blanket chest in every way is very typical of a late fourth quarter uh, style blanket chest that was very commonly made and used in Pennsylvania. Size wise, the depth of the box, uh, the construction of it is all very, very similar to similar blanket chests from that time period. What seems a little unusual and a little out of place here, and I don't have a good answer for this, is some of the painting and decoration on it. Here's a view of the detail of the top of the, of the chest. The chest was owned by Salome or Salome Keller or Collar, 1783. Her dates are 1768 to 1843. When she was married in 17, well, the chest was given to her presumably in 1783. She married Johannes Becker or John Baker, which I found in some records, uh, his name was anglicized, the following year in 1784, which seems to match very well um, with the date she got the chest and when she was married. Sometimes these are called hope chests and maybe were used to store items for um, the future life, uh, the future maybe um, housekeeping of uh, the owner. That's a close up of, um, of that, um, of the name and the date on the top. It's amazing how taking that picture made that bluer than it, it seems to appear in the other picture. But notice all the little decorations on the top there. I, I, it seems to me that somebody took, I don't know if it was a brush or their finger, and after they painted it, they just made all those marks all over the top there. According to the Keller family, well, according to, according to some research I did, uh, Salome Keller's parents were Jacob Imhoff Keller and Barbara Keller. He was the son of um, Jacob and Elizabeth Keller, who were buried in God's Acre, very close to where Conrad Beisel is buried. Um, Salome and, um, well, the, um, the line uh, to Harold Keller Galebach passes through Jacob Landis. Salome was a sister to Jacob Landis Keller. Now, the earliest relative of theirs that they know owned this was a great nephew named Christian Keller to Salome or Sally Keller, caller. And how he got it, they don't know. But it passed through Christian 
Keller's family all the way down to Harold Keller Galebach, and then his family donated to us. We, were, we particularly were interested in this chest because here was another example of a householder family at the time, uh, something that a, a daughter owned and used. Now, so, Sally's grandparents, Jacob and Elizabeth Keller, and her parents, Jacob Imhoff and Barbara Keller, were members, householder members of the, the, of the effort community at that time. Presumably, she was raised in a householder family. Now, at some point, though, she and her husband, um, John Baker or Johannes Becker, drifted away uh, from, from the German Seventh-day Baptist Church, which was happened all too frequently throughout the 1800s. They were buried. They're buried actually very close by to the, um, to the Ephra Cloister in what's known as the Hauk Fry. Uh, cemetery, not far away from the cloister, but it seems that they were later um, involved with the Brethren Church. Here's a detail of the end of the box showing the, the handle, and you can see some more of that um, um, interesting decoration there. I don't know if that was created by a finger or some other, something else. And a detail of the, what we call a hex sign on the top of the box. Casters were added to this uh, box at some point in time. So it, it could be moved around. This was, um, Purchased uh, with back to cloister funds in the early, uh, actually in January of 2020, an Adam and Eve uh, broadside with a uh, song about Adam and Eve. This was printed by Samuel Bauman. Uh, earlier we saw a Concordia broadside that Samuel Bauman did. Uh, the apples on the tree are hand colored with uh, watercolor. Um, the melody uh, at the top there, if you can see the melody, uh, translated as God of heaven and earth and was originally written in 1642. That melody that you could sing this song to. Um, um, Adam and Eve broadsides were very uh, widely printed and, and used throughout Pennsylvania Dutch country. Many different printers from um, Lancaster effort, of course, uh, Reading, uh, different places. Uh, printed variations of this broadside. Many of them had different images to illustrate it, uh, maybe a little bit different title at the top, uh, but it was very popular uh, throughout uh, Pennsylvania Dutch country. It's believed that this, um, this was done maybe about 1816 by once again, Samuel Bauman, about near the time of his um, giving up his printing career. And here we have that same title again, um, a Nick de Glyke broadside, another purchase in January with Back to the Cloister Funds, uh, translated again, spiritual lesson about the futility of human life. The melody is, um, oh, excuse me, I got ahead of myself. And this melody here is the God of heaven and earth, not the Adam and Eve one side. Once again, this was something that um, was printed by the printer, you know, maybe to sell and make a little bit of money. Um, the little, um, end piece here, tail piece here, was a tail piece that was used at Ephrata. And uh, basically through that and some other stuff, it is attributed to Ephrata. But it fits, the story of this fits very well into the, the religious belief of the Ephrata community. According to a man by the name of Herman Wellenruther, and I'm going to show you his book to see if you can see it. This is a book that we do sell in the museum store. There's a little bit of glare on it, unfortunately. 
Um, this is a very good book about broadsides. And, and uh, Don Yoder's book is very good too. It has different kinds of things in it. That is the only book though, Wellen Ruther's book where I could find information about this broadside. And this is probably what was in the Pennypacker collection, this broadside, not that little pamphlet with the, the same name, with just some of the words in a different order. This is probably what Pennypacker had. And where that broadside wound up, I couldn't tell you today. Although I found out that I think in Columbia University, there's another copy of this, of this broadside. According to Wellen Ruther, these are all pretty scarce. And um, it was part of a series of, of broadsides that were done on um, about Christian virtues. It's hard to place a date on this. I think there was some date 1770. I saw another another possibility that this was more near the uh, very early 1800s, which would make that possible product of the Bauman family. This is uh, same, the same broadside, but uh, I, uh, in the picture that you just saw, I um, uh, cropped it down to just that you could see just the broadside. This is how we purchased it. And it's in this frame now. And that um, the broadside has been conserved and that is an archival framing. I last month uh, talked about the next two items that also were purchased in January with back to the cloister funds last January. The um, WPA posters, the, this is the so-called red one. Uh, designed by Catherine Milhouse, who was in, uh, through the WPA um, program uh, in the, from about 1935 to 1943. Uh, Milhouse, uh, working out of Philadelphia, was the head of the department that produced many hundreds of posters pr promoting, um, you might say, tourism. I'm not going to go into this a whole lot more because I talked about this last month quite a bit. And this, of course, is the blue one that was also designed by Catherine Milhouse, who was an illustrator, uh, attended the Academy of Fine Arts, um, paid her way through college uh, by illustrating magazines, wrote and illustrated children's books. Her probably most famous book was called The Egg Tree. We're coming down near the end, folks. I appreciate your hanging in there with me. Uh, this was the last purchase um, in 2020. We purchased this from the uh, Jim Shuddy estate. By this time, Jim had passed on and we purchased this from um, sale, uh, several sales that were held of, of his items. This is a manuscript agreement and some other, other information. Uh, signed by, as you can see at the bottom here, was signed by Brother Yabez, who was Peter Miller, uh, Brother Philemon, who was John Reisman, Brother Obadiah, who was Samuel Funk, and um, Brother George Zinn, or Georg Zinn, down here in the bottom. This was an agreement that he would not charge the effort of community for the milling uh, of flour for the, the mill. It's my understanding that usually one tenth of a bushel was the fee charged by a miller to uh, process your grain. But apparently through this agreement, he was not going to charge the celibates uh, to do uh, mill their grain. This is the reverse of that page with a different agreement, essentially for the same thing signed by brother Yabez, Peter Miller. Uh, and George Zinn down here at the bottom. I unfortunately cannot make this name out, this sort of uh, stain here blocked it out. There's George Zinn and there's Brother Yabez, Peter Miller. 
George Zinn was the community miller, ran the community mill till about a, about 1771, 72, somewhere in there, and moved over to what is today Lebanon County. Uh, had a mill over there on Zinn Mill Road in Lebanon County near Quentin. Uh, that kind of accounts for the fact that um, his name sort of, um, uh, his account book that we have, we actually have George Zinn's account book from when he was the miller for the community. That accounts for the reason why it ends around 1770, 71, because uh, Zinn moved away. Apparently he must have stayed a, uh, a member because when he died, uh, his son paid for that, that love feast for him, as you may remember. Oh, you know, I, well, actually I skipped over a page. Oops, went too far. This is two more documents that part, were part of that same purchased, purchased from uh, the Shoddy estate. Um, and they have not been translated. We need to do some more work. Uh, the last entry on this side of this, this was actually one page and they were, it was separated. Is 1788. The other, the other paper that you saw was 1770, and this is 1778, or excuse me, 1788. And that's the end, folks. Um, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them for you. Well, thank you very much, Carrie. That was interesting. Uh, it shows we have a lot of. Um, very generous individuals connected with the cloister. Um, those who have given to the Back to the Cloister Fund, we thank everybody to make for making all of this possible. I did put in the chat the link to the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission's online archives uh, for uh, collections at all of the different sites. Carrie's been busy during shutdown, uh, increasing our uh, input uh, with our collections on there, but they have all of the different sites uh, you can access um, from that website that I posted into the chat box. And I don't see any other questions at this time. Craig, I, I just want to, if you're still here, I just want to make sure, did we answer your question about the, the word? If you want to unmute, you can. Oh, maybe he maybe he bucked out here on us. Okay, we'll assume we did. Well, All right, our, our, yeah, Carrie. If anybody has any questions at any time, you can always uh, contact me at the cloister. Uh, my email is uh, k m o h n at p a dot gov. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, email usually is always the best way to contact me. All right. Well, I think since we're running a little late, I don't see any other questions. Everybody's saying how much they enjoyed the program, Carrie. I uh, just want to remind everyone our next uh, virtual academy will be April 8th at 7 p.m. Uh, and we'll have something a little bit different this next time. Our student historians are going to be uh, presenting this program on April 8th. And you're going to get into the action because it's going to test your knowledge of little known facts from national, state, and local history. And it's called the Great Unforgettable Forgotten History Quiz. So be sure to spread the word. We'll be sending out emails and information can also be found on our website. So I thank everybody for joining us this evening. And we look forward to seeing you uh, again next month. Have a good evening, everyone.